To the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we present the third in a series of episodes featuring special guest appearances by our mysterious patrons. Our guest today is Ryan. Hello. Ryan is a generous supporter of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, and as a thank you, invited him to join us for our discussion of an episode of his choosing. Ryan, what are we listening to today? The Man from Damascus from Rocky Jordan. Set in Cairo, the program tells the story of cafe owner Rocky Jordan, who has a penchant for attracting mystery and intrigue. Rocky Jordan premiered on CBS Radio October 31st, 1948, and ran until September 10th, 1951. The character of Rocky Jordan first appeared in a different CBS program, A Man Named Jordan. This series ran from 1945 to 1947, and, other than being set in Istanbul rather than Cairo, was very similar to Rocky Jordan. Despite its two-year run, only two episodes survive today. Veteran radio actor Jack Moyles played Rocky in A Man Named Jordan and the initial run of Rocky Jordan. Moyle's other radio appearances include starring opposite Raymond Burr as Major Daggett in Fort Laramie and numerous supporting roles in The Whistler, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, and yours truly, Johnny Dalton. Rocky Jordan was revived for a brief run in the summer of 1951, starring George Raft as Rocky. At the time, CBS was in talks with George Raft's production company regarding a possible television adaptation of the series, which may explain the network's decision to place Jack Moyles with Raft. Sadly, the television series never happened, and CBS broadcast the final episode of Rocky Jordan, August 22nd, 1951. And now let's listen to The Man from Damascus from Rocky Jordan. First broadcast, June 12th, 1949. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listening to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Live with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man from Damascus. Damascus, capital of Syria. Population, 300,000 or so. They say it's the oldest city in the world that people still live in. Uh, I wouldn't know. But I do know there's a street in Damascus named the street called Straight. And I also know I once met a man from Damascus. And he was as twisted as they come. But back to a hot Wednesday afternoon. Chris was at the bar serving up some arak. And I was standing at the front of the cafe looking out into the Cairo streets. That's when an old man, dressed in a boy's postal uniform and riding a bicycle, stopped in front of the tambourine. When he came in, he was carrying a wet envelope in his hand. I have for the Mr. Jordan one special delivery letter. Would the Mr. Jordan sign his name on this line? The Mr. Jordan would? I thank the Mr. Jordan. Yeah. Here you are, Pop. Buy yourself an ice cube. Muta Shakir. Muta Shakir, then. It was a white envelope with some dirty finger smudges and a Cairo postmark. There was no return address. I looked at it for a moment, then tore it open. The first thing I saw, flat and crisp, was a pack of Egyptian pound notes. And I did a quick tabulation. One thousand Egyptian pounds, 
5,000 American dollars. And clipped to the money was a short note. Partial payment for services to be rendered, 1,000 pounds. I'm waiting for you at 16 Sharia El Nazar. Seven o'clock this evening will be fine. And it was signed, The Man from Damascus. Well, I don't take easily to somebody's bidding. If someone wants to see me, he comes to me. So I put the money in the safe, but figured that wasn't the end of the man from Damascus. Exactly seven o'clock that evening, I knew I had figured right. Rocky. Hmm? What is it, Chris? Fell out to see you. Where? He's in your office. I tried to stop him, but he... Oh, that's all right. I'm sort of expecting him. Mean-looking guy. Want me to come with you? No, no, I'll handle it. Take over the till, will you? Sure, Rocky. Hello, Jordan. Make yourself at home. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <coughs> Pretty good booze. Too rich for your taste, buddy. Put it down. Yeah, all right. You know, it's funny. Figured you differently. Everybody in town says you're a right guy. Maybe you've been talking to the wrong people. What do you want? <laughs> you. You have been talking to the wrong people. I'm not for sale. That thousand pounds is just a start, pal. There's more where that come from. And there always is. Ah, come on, big shot. Button up your shirt. It's seven o'clock. You got the point, man. I can't make it. Ah, that's a big mistake. Your money's in the safe. You can have it back. Ah, that is not my instructions. Oh, so you're just a leg man. Ah, something like that. You and me, we're working for the same man. All right, buddy, you're through talking. There's the door. Get away from the door, Jordan, or I'll pin you to the wall. Seven-inch blade, Jordan. Damascus steel. Got it? I got it. All right, put the knife away. You'll cut your hand. I'll, uh, I'll come with you if your boss wants to see me that badly. I wasn't going to argue with a seven-inch double-edged blade, especially the way that monkey was waving it in the air. Well, we left the tambourine, climbed into his car, and drove through the Cairo streets out one of the city gates... We ended up in front of a place called the House of Sand. It should have been called a pile of scrap, because that's what it looked like. But the knife man said it was a hotel. Two minutes later, my pal knocked on the door of room 12. Who is there? Jordan. He's come for the rest of the dough. You're taking a lot for granted, Buster. Quiet, you. All right, you may let him come in. Go on in, Jordan, and meet your new boss. I walked inside. My pal with the knife shut the door behind me and stayed outside. Then I saw him, a man from Damascus. He was tall and big, but I couldn't tell what he looked like. His whole face was wrapped in bandages, and he reminded me of those pictures I once saw of the invisible man. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Nice of you to come. Sit down. Uh, I'll take it standing. Well, it's good to meet again. Is it not, Mr. Jordan? Again? You do not remember? But you should. Damascus, 1939... Well, maybe it's my new appearance. I had a face then. What do you got now? Let's talk about Damascus. All right. You wish a drink? No, I just gave it up. Mr. Jordan, you wronged me in Damascus. I did? Yes, you wronged me most severely. So severely that I've never forgotten. And I said to myself that someday I would come for you. Well, I am here. Welcome to Cairo. Jordan, I'm not just talking for pleasure. You sure you got the right guy? And do not try to tell me you do not remember. You are the right man and you know it. But you are fortunate, Mr. Jordan. How's that figure? I'm going to give you a chance to erase our difference. And make a little money besides. You see, there's someone in Cairo that I want even more than you. So how do I figure? You are going to bring him to me. His name is Alex Zarko. Zarko? It's a pretty big order. I know, but I think you can do it. The police have had a dragnet out for two weeks trying to track him down. And I want to get to him before they do. I think you can bring him to me. You know Cairo better than any man I know of. You know where men like Zarko would hide and how to get to him. Ah, sorry, friend. You've got the wrong guy. Jordan, listen to me. I would find him myself if I could. I just do not know Cairo. And I cannot go wandering around like this. I'm giving you a chance to square a dirty deal and make a little money on the side. I will double that thousand pounds and call off our little difference. Uh, What have you got against Sarko? He took something from me. What? 
My face. Oh. I want to find him, Jordan. I must. You do not know what it is to feel that you can never walk the streets again without a covering and the thing you once called a face. Well, what about it, Mr. Jordan? No, no deal. You've got a private vendetta with Zarko. Keep it that way. Yeah, there's your thousand pounds back. Buy yourself another boy. I walked out of the house of sand, and the knife man was gone. I found a taxi and headed back for the tambourine. Alex Zarko. Yeah, an all-around no-good guy. The Egyptian police wanted him on an attempted assassination, espionage work, with an assorted killing or two thrown in. The police had all the roads covered, the trains and the flights out of the city. They figured they had him bottled up pretty well, and it was just a matter of time before they bundled him. Well, back at the tambourine, I drew myself a beer, found a back table, and did some thinking about the man and the bandages in the city of Damascus. What's up, Ralph? Hmm? Oh, nothing, Chris, just thinking. Say, uh, did you ever hear me talk about Damascus? Damascus? Yeah, spent nine months there once working for an oil company. No, I don't remember you saying anything about it. Why? Oh, nothing. Just trying to bring back a little memory. Drop it. It doesn't matter. Sure, Rock. I'll get back to... Excuse me, gentlemen. You are Mr. Jordan? That's right. May I talk with you, please? It will take but a moment. Uh, All right, Chris. I'll talk to you later. Sure, Rocky. Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I did not wish to trouble you, but I found that I had no other course. My name is Sandra Marr, and I'm from Damascus in Syria. Uh Uh-huh. You're traveling in Cairo's on the Grand Tour. This is not a trip for pleasure. I'm looking for someone... If his name is Alex Zarko, you got lots of company. No, his name is not Alex Zarko. It is Paul Marr, and he is my husband. Paul Marr? I don't know anyone by that name. You may not know him by his name, Mr. Jordan, but I'm positive that you have met him. And how do you figure that? Paul said he had some business in Cairo. He left Damascus four days ago with a man whose name I do not know, but he was the same man who left the tambourine with you earlier tonight. It is my belief that he took you to see Paul. Oh, I get it. I tried, but I was not able to follow you through the streets of Cairo, so I've waited outside your cafe till you returned. I must see Paul. Would you take me to him? No. Would you tell me, then, where he is? Mr. Jordan, Paul's business, as he calls it, it is is trouble. Some terrible sort of trouble, I know. Oh, you're right there. He's a fine man, Mr. Jordan. A wonderful man, but things have not gone well since his face. He's in trouble, and I've got to help him. He's got a revenge on, lady, with a guy named Zarko and me. There's nothing fine about that. Revenge? Paul? Oh, no, it it must be something else. He's not that kind of man. Then you don't know him very well. It is true. We have not been married for long. Uh Uh-huh. Look, why don't you just go back to Damascus and forget it? You're in for trouble here. Something's going to happen. Where is Paul, Mr. Jordan? A place called the House of Sand. Out of the city, through the gate of the Bar El Nasser. Taxi will take you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I shall not forget the help you've given me. She walked out of the tambourine, and I hoped that that would be the last I'd see of her and the man from Damascus and Alex Zargo. How vain can your hopes be sometimes? Well, we rolled the last on-the-cuff customer out of the TAM about 1.15 in the morning. Chris threw the lock on the front door, and I doused the lights. I'll just scoot out the back way, Rocky. Oh, all right, Chris. Good night. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Rocky, look out! Find the guard at TAM's quick. Vengeance, Jordan! Vengeance! Rocky. You hear me, Jordan? Quiet, Chris. Well, if you do and you are not dead, then I will come for you again. You are listening to The Man from Damascus, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. Remember that 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon is the new time for Rocky Jordan, so join us each Sunday at 5. And plan to tune in 30 minutes earlier to hear Call the Police at 4.30. So you will have a full hour of excitement and action. (laughs) 
And now we take you back to Cairo for another adventure with Rocky Jordan, the man from Damascus. Well, after the man from Damascus threw those slugs at me, I took out after him, chasing him through the darkened streets. But it's easy to lose someone in the winding Cairo streets, and that's just what I did. I got back to the Cafe Tambourine about 45 minutes later, and Chris wasn't there alone. Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo police, was there, too, waiting for me. Well, Jordan, so you've returned. Oh, hiya, Sam. What brings you here this time of night? I phoned him, Rock. I told him. I thought you'd be better. Uh, all right, Chris. Uh, see you tomorrow. Sure. Uh, good night, Captain. Uh, good night. Well, Jordan, I'm waiting. Waiting? For what, Sam? For you to tell me what this is all about. There's nothing to say. Jordan, the man who shot at you from the alley called out vengeance. This much Chris told me. Therefore, I can assume that this man is after you for some hurt he believes you have inflicted upon him. Uh, it's close. What is this that you have done to him, Jordan? Beats me, Sam. Jordan, how can you expect me to I believe... Tell you, Sam, I don't know. Then I shall let that pass. Jordan, who is this man who shot at you? I'm afraid that's my business. I'll just handle it my own way. Jordan! Oh, I... stop worrying about it. You got your hands full with Alex Zarko. Oh, fear not. We will capture Alex Zarko. Tell me, has Zarko something to do with this shooting? If you mean, did he throw those slugs at me? No. I meant exactly what I said. Does Zarko have anything to do with the shooting? Maybe. Oh, Jordan, you, you are most exasperating. Oh, just a little trick I picked up in my travels. Very well, very well. I cannot force you to speak. However, I wish to warn you that if someone else is injured, some innocent party drawn into this private conflict of yours, I shall hold you responsible. Oh, thanks, Sam. That's swell of you. No one will get hurt, believe me. Except maybe that friend of mine. For your sake, I hope you are right. I would not wish to use my office, Jordan, to have you expelled from Cairo. <laughs> I started out bright and early the next morning to see if I could find the man from Damascus. Stop number one was the house of sand, room 12. I pounded on the door, no answer. I rattled the doorknob and the door came open. I went in. I could see why no one had bothered to throw the lock. The room was empty. Paul Marr, the man from Damascus, had done a quick checkout. I moved down to the front desk to see if I could get a forwarding address. Sitting in a rocking chair, rolling back and forth, was a wrinkled relic left over from the days of the pharaohs. A chortling sound was coming from her throat, and then I saw why. She was reading a U.S. comic book called The Phantom Menace. A lady... A lady, you got a customer. Oh, young man, you are observing an old lady being devoured by pleasure. Well, I'm certainly glad you're having fun, but could you give me a minute? Oh, the Phantom Menace has captured the brick brawn, thrust him in wire... And is dipping him head first into a barrel of pickle brine 100 times. Very funny. I'm being consumed with joy. Well, if you can grab hold of yourself for a minute, you can earn a pound note. Hey, my laughter has suddenly left me. Oh, fine. Look, I'm trying to get a forwarding address on number 12. Hey, that would be a short, fat man with a bald spot. A seller of fly paper. That would be a big man with bandages on his face. A seller of death. Death comes higher than flypaper. Could you make it two pounds? I could. Uh, alas, now that I find a fortune at my fingertips, I cannot claim it. What does that mean? I do not know where your friend has gone. And indeed, you are not the only one who is seeking him. A young lady came this morning. She said she was his wife. Uh, where'd she go? I gave her room ten. She said she would wait to see if her husband returned. If you wish to see her, I can call no, her. No, no, no. What time did number 12 leave? Six this morning. How? By taxi. I called one. Do you know the driver? Do I know him? A kelpie, no good evil dog. Well, has he got a name? Hali Amar. Residence 303 Sharia Shaman. It is worth two pounds just to mention his name. Ah, uh, here. Keep it. And thanks. Go on back to your reading. <laughs> I shall, I shall once again bait in ecstasy. And she did. I left her sitting there, wetting the pages, and looked up Holly Amar. It cost me two more pounds to open him up. And all he could say was that he left Mar off at an all-night dive called the Harem. So that was my next stop. 
couple of hundred pounds of fat was pushing a wet rag over the counter in slow motion. A red-headed Englishman, deep in his cups, was throwing darts at a picture of a dame short of clothes. But what I was looking at was a guy at the end of the bar tilling a bottle of beer. It was the knife man who had first taken me to see Paul Marr. I moved his way, but he saw me and lit out for the back door. I took out after him fast like the super chief on a downgrade. He took me through the backyard, over a fence, across an empty lot. But I put a stop to the marathon with a flying tackle and we rolled into a mud hole. He reached for his knife, but I need him and the fight started to go out of him. All right, where is he? Who? You know who that Damascus friend of yours, Paul Moore. How did you know his name? That doesn't matter. What I want now is his address. Do not worry, Jordan. He will come to you. Well, I can't wait. Now give it. My, my throne, your knee. The address? I cannot tell. We'll try a face full of mud, then. All right. All right, I tell. 1042 Sharia Fakar. A small hotel by the name of Little Nile. Uh, okay. I'm going to put you on ice at the tambourine. Chris will take care of you till I have a chance to talk to your boss alone. The Little Nile was a termite trap on Sharia Fakar, and Mar was holed up second floor back. I stood in front of his door a few minutes later, listening, trying to catch any sounds from inside. I didn't hear a thing. I tried the doorknob easily. The door was locked. So I took a deep breath, kicked at it, and all the rotten wood gave way. The first thing I saw in the darkened room was the figure sitting in a chair across the room facing the door. The second thing I saw were the bandages around his face. So I knew it was Paul Marr. And the third thing I saw was the Italian-made gun in his hand, pointing toward me. What has kept you so long, Jordan? All right. Sorry, I didn't know you were waiting. I would not advance toward me any more steps, Jordan. That is wise. Well, you have come. I had assumed that if I did not kill you last night, you would come to me. It saved me parading my conspicuous appearance through the Cairo streets. So you have found me. But unfortunately, I have the gun. You're not going to kill me here, Mar. Sabaya knows you're after me. You'll never get out of the city with those bandages. You may be right, Jordan. Perhaps I will not kill you. My original proposition still holds. Bring Alex Zarko to me and our little difference shall be forgotten. I've forgotten it already. Jordan, I want Zarko. I want him more than I want you or anything else. Bring Ma. him to... Sandra's in town. Sandra? Your wife. She's in Cairo looking for you. She's at the House of Sand right now, waiting for you to come back. No. I saw her. She came to me to ask about you. You know, she thinks a lot of you. She doesn't believe you're the kind of a guy to have a vendetta on. She doesn't believe you could kill me or Zarko, regardless of what he did to your face. Stop it, Jordan. Do not unnerve me. And do not attempt to change the subject. I want Zarko even more than you. I will let you go if you help me. Here. Here. I shall show you my good faith by throwing my gun into the corner. That was a mistake, Mar. You know I can't help you. I told you once already, and that still goes. I'm not butting into a private feud. But I am, Jordan. Sam. Well, you get around, don't you? I know you well enough, Jordan, to realize that you would not allow someone to shoot at you and then forget it. So when you would not tell me who had done it, I knew, too, that if I followed you long enough, you would lead me to him. You always do. Look, Sam, this is a private thing between Mar and I myself. I have told you once, Jordan, violence is not a private matter. I will not allow killing if I can help it. And I will not allow you, Jordan, or Mr. Mar to interfere with the police capture of Alex Zarko. Then you haven't got him yet, eh? No, but I shall have him in time. Mr. Mar shall not. Mr. Mar, you will please remove the bandages from your face. What? I said that you will please remove your bandages. Better do it. Sam's not kidding. Very well. Very well, then I shall remove my bandages. I shall step into the light, gentlemen, so that you may see all, so that you may see what was once a face. I watched Paul Marr unwind the bandages, uncovering first what once was a chin, then the battered skin around the cheeks, the nose over the forehead. Then I noticed his stare, a peculiar, hard kind of stare, then I saw where it came from. A left eye that couldn't blink. There. There you have it. 
Now you can see why I feel as I do about Alex Zarko. I am most sorry I had to subject you to this, Mr. Marr. But I still cannot allow a personal revenge to interfere with my execution of the law. It is customary in Cairo in affairs of this nature to use the following procedure. There is a train leaving Cairo for Alexandria in one hour and five minutes. You will please be on the train. Sam. And you, Jordan, shall remain in my custody until Mr. Marr has left the city. And what about Alex Zarko? He is and shall remain my problem. You have then one hour, Mr. Marr. I will meet you at the Cairo station to make certain you have boarded the train. Now you may put the bandages back on your face. Well, Sam and I left Paul Marr at the hotel and headed for police headquarters. We didn't talk much about Paul. There wasn't anything to say. I was still trying to figure out in my mind what I could possibly have done to him in Damascus, but nothing came. And seeing him, or what was left of him, stirred no memory. At headquarters, Sam had a few things to do. So did I. I put in a call to the House of Sand and asked for Sandra Marr. Yes, this is Sandra Marr. Uh, Miss Marr, this is Rocky Jordan. Who? I was here. Oh, never mind that. There's something I want to tell you. About Paul? Uh, sort of. Throw your clothes in a suitcase and go back to Damascus. Oh, I thought you had some good news for me. I thought you understood I will go no place without Paul. Well, you're not going to find him in Cairo. The police are moving him out. The police? What have the police to do with Paul? Paul will tell you if he wants to. Now, go on. You've got a better chance of seeing him again in Damascus. But, Mr. Jordan... And see if you can keep him out of trouble, huh? Good luck. Well, that was that. All that remained was to see Paul Marr climb on the train for Alexandria and hope he could straighten himself out. And hope, too, that he and his wife, Sandra, would get together. Well, a little while later, I drove to the train station with Sam, still in police custody. There weren't many people there in the hot of the afternoon, but standing near the end of the platform, next to a large sign of the flying red horse that accented his white bandages, was the man we were looking for, Paul Marr. Sam and I walked up to him, and he glared at us through the slits in his wrappings. Well, Mr. Ma, you will be leaving Cairo in a few moments. Uh, if after a year has passed you wish to return to our city, write me a letter explaining your reasons, and I shall see what can be done to make Cairo available to you once more. Mar nodded, <coughs> climbed on the train, and had headed out of the city. Sam and I turned and started back to his car. That's when it hit me, and I took off in double time. Jordan, where are you going? For a train ride. I think you better come along. I chased down the platform and caught the train. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Sam climb onto the train farther down the line. Then I started through the cars, going from one to another, looking for the man in bandages. I traveled through four cars before I finally spotted him. When he saw me, I guess he figured what I had on my mind, because he took off fast, going the other way, but I kept right after him. The train had picked up speed, lurching us from side to side. Then going around a bend, the momentum pinned him momentarily against a seat, and I was on him. His fist started working, and so did mine. We had ourselves a fine little fight there, rolling around the floor of the moving train, until Sam Sabaya caught up with us and pulled a gun. Uh, that put a quick stop to the fight. Jordan, you will please explain what the meaning of this is. Sure. Glad to, Sam. Have him take off his bandages. But, Jordan, I... I do Have him take understand. off the bandages, and I think you will. Very well. You will please remove the bandages, Mr. Ma. Ah, uh, take them off, buddy, or I'll take them off for you. Yeah. That's his stuff. Now, just a little more. Let Sam see who you really are. Well, there you are, Sam. Not Paul Marr at all. But the guy you've been looking for for weeks. The guy who's been trying to escape your dragnet and get out of the city. Meet Alex Zarko. Well, the thing came apart at the seams. It was all an elaborate plan of Zarko's. The police had him trapped in the city, needed a way out. So he got his knife man to dig up Paul Marr in Damascus and bring him to town. Then he had Marr, all wrapped up in bandages, create a fuss, like his revenge against me, which was strictly a phony. Nothing too serious, just enough to get himself run out of Cairo. Then Zarko takes his place, wraps himself in the bandages, and starts to leave, almost with a police escort. It would have worked fine, except for one thing. Marr's disfigured face and his left eye that couldn't blink. Zarko couldn't control his, and standing on the platform of the train station, he blinked his eye once. And that was once too often. Well, all that remained was Paul Marr, his face, and Sandra. 
And later, in Sabaya's office, we got to talking about that. Jordan, where do you suppose Paul Marty is now? In the House of Sand. I told him Sandra was there waiting for him. You realize, of course, that I must send some men to apprehend him. Here. Yeah. Why do you suppose he allowed himself to aid Alex Zarko? Put yourself in his place. A face like his and a lot of desperation. He was working a business deal, getting money any way he could, figuring he'd use the dough in a plastic surgery job. It'd make him look like a, a human being again. Yes, quite so. You understand Ma will have a jail sentence to serve for aiding a criminal. Mm -hmm. And it may be possible for me to confiscate the money Zarko gave him. Sure, if you worked on it, you could possibly take the dough from him. That is, if you don't forget that he's got... Are you suggesting, Jordan, that I deliberately allow myself to forget that a financial arrangement uh, existed between Mal and Zarko? That's right, sir. Jordan, I have always suspected you are an unscrupulous man. <laughs> sure I am. Remember the time I tried to sell that Monte Carlo swindler a half interest in the tombs of Memlooks? <laughs> Remember? No, no, I, I guess I've forgotten. Perhaps I am getting old. My memory is not what it used to be. Thanks, Sam. See you soon. <laughs> It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Adrian Jando and Larry Roman. Life with Luigi will be heard tonight at 8 over most of these stations. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was The Man from Damascus from Rocky Jordan here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And we are joined by one of our favorite Patreons and a generous supporter of our podcast, Ryan. Ryan, once again, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And this was your selection, this Rocky Jordan. I've got many things to discuss, I'm sure we all do, but uh, why did you choose this to bring to our podcast? Well, we've mentioned Rocky Jordan in many of the uh, monthly broadcasts that you've done for the Patreon supporters, and we've never actually brought it to the table. And I used to listen to Rocky Jordan many years ago. And I hadn't listened to it since. And so I thought, well, it gives me a chance to rerun through the series and listen to a bunch of fun ones. And I think it really exemplified the best of the series. For good or for bad, people may not like the series, but I think this represents one of the, the best examples of the series. Well, let's start here. I've heard of Rocky Jordan a lot. and I've never taken the time to find out what it was because I always assume it sounds like a detective show, Right. Rocky Jordan, detective. And I'm like, ah, there's so many of them. And they're all, you know, some are good, some are okay, some are great. But there's a lot of detective shows, especially from this era, of course. And so I just never gave it the time of day. When I started listening to this and found out, oh, this is adventure taking place in Egypt stuff. It's Casablanca forever. <laughs> it just goes on and on. This was fantastic. This is everything I love. And I'm assuming you brought this to the podcast. I thought you were going to say, because you love me the most. <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking of you when I chose this series, because you're always get to the castle and I'm yeah. way on board with you. And this was get to the Bedouin, have an adventure <laughs> and be done with it. I. It was so fun. Here's the thing about this era, Egypt in particular, but the Middle East in general, it's not an accurate depiction, and, and and we've talked about this in the podcast before, but I finally figured out what it is. The Middle East, and more specifically Egypt, was kind of the Middle Earth of storytelling, <laughs> you know? It was this fantasy land that we didn't know much about, and I love that perception of Egyptian society and culture of the time, and it's far off and exotic and odd and exciting and... There's a cobra that can come out of a basket and bite you at any moment. 
<laughs> uh, that being said, one of the things that stood out to me about this particular episode is that Cairo is presented as a multicultural, bustling city, and there really isn't that sort of other quality that you get in some of the pulpier old time radio shows. Um, there are lots of ethnicities there and they are good guys and they are bad guys. And it is not really as race coded as right. others in this genre. Uh, obviously it's American radio from this era. So it's going to all be white actors doing accents, but I thought right. it was a more compelling premise. And Sam Sabaya, the, the head detective guy, I found him interesting because he is a law and order person and is sophisticated. He's not just a thug in a uniform. He actually believes in the law and is a, a credit to the police force rather than just out there. I will say, Sam, um, the, it is a, a real joy to me in the, pardon the phrase, competence porn. And like <laughs> Sam is good competence porn. Like he's smart. He does his job well. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's not contrived. Yeah, yeah, he is not the incompetent local police. Uh, I would agree with you so much on that, Joshua, that it is a a less children-esque version of the era of Egypt. You know, like it's got a storytelling flavor to it that adds some depth and presence to this far off land that isn't normally there. And when I say children's version, like if you get into like a Superman goes to Egypt, you know, it gets a little, <laughs> a little basic of the time. Although admit it, you would totally listen to Superman goes to Egypt. <laughs> yeah, I have, it exists. It's real. <laughs> I think it's even called that, but um, <laughs> uh, here's the other thing about this episode being introduced to Rocky Jordan. It's not only the, the premise of the whole thing, which I thought was cool. There's so many elements that I really loved about it, but I kept thinking about you scrimshot, but Joshua, the writing in this is just phenomenally fun. And I was hoping that you would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I know you mentioned that this is right up Eric's alley. Cause it gets to the castle and the pace starts at a run. And those are things I enjoy, but they don't necessarily have to be there for me to enjoy a, a script. But what this has that will always make me happy is that really sharp dialogue. And there is no uninteresting secondary characters. The script takes the time to make everyone colorful and interesting, even if they're there just to provide exposition. Uh, that old lady... <laughs> who has the yeah. best line <laughs> i'm consumed with joy yeah you are you are seeing an old lady being devoured by pleasure <laughs> right <laughs> like whoa but she's reading an american comic book not only that she's reading a comic book named the phantom menace yes <laughs> which i started to think i wonder if they heard this and stole it but uh, no one has ever been devoured by pleasure while watching the phantom menace so <laughs> that's there's at least one solid, difference <laughs> solid point it brings me to this question for everybody because of the writing there has to be so many moments where all of us went oh that's clever or amazing or i love that line i gotta hear what everybody's favorite line is because my favorite line by far is i had a face then yeah what do you have now <laughs> <laughs> my favorite really and it's my peculiar taste is just the whole character of chris this character who is like okay i'll look up okay <laughs> bye <laughs> it's like how do i get that job that's awesome I liked Rocky's way of dissing somebody when the the fat guy said, have a drink. And Rocky goes, nah, I just gave it up. Yep. <laughs> yep. I also love the imagery of the bandaged man. He looked like the invisible man. So it was lovely to have Claude Rains in my head for the rest of that show. Right, here's a big question. <laughs> When he gets back on that train, which was a great piece of production work, you could hear him running and catching the train and getting on it. It was just production value of this and is amazing. But he gets on that train. <laughs> I had no idea it was the guy until it was the guy. And then I felt stupid because I went, I bet you everybody else saw this coming down Fifth Avenue. 
I got it exactly when the script wanted me to get it. Nice. So kudos to the script of like it was the instant he got on the train and, and Rocky has that doubt like, oh, uh, I got it. I knew it would be a clue as soon as he described his face when Sam the policeman asked him to unwrap the bandage and he said a, a left eye that didn't blink. It was so specific and it was the only th- part of the person's face you'd be able to see through the mask. I knew there was going to be some sort of identity swap involving this mask, but I think you all kind of knew that that was in the cards from the get-go once you introduce a guy who has a bandaged face, that at some point that would play a role in the story. Really, really hoping he was invisible. That's all I was doing. (laughs) I had thought that early on, but then it didn't manifest in any way that I was expecting, so I dropped the idea, and then when it came back, I was delightfully surprised. Um... I, I blew by it. Of, this is my first time hearing uh, Rocky Jordan, and I will totally confess, I always thought we were talking about Rocky Fortune whenever we're yeah. talking about this. So <laughs> it's a delightful surprise. No besmirching Rocky Fortune. but It's was... a lovely, completely <laughs> different type of show. <laughs> yes. I don't know if I've listened to any Rocky Fortune. Yes, you have on this podcast. Come on, man. <laughs> did we? We did a, no, did we did a holiday one. Did I like it? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think I did, you were rather indifferent. I stopped listening after Rocky VI. <laughs> uh, one technical thing they do in here that other radio shows do this as well, but I thought they did it very effectively, is in the narration of fight scenes that are being described in the first person in the past tense, but being performed in the present tense uh, with the intent and with the reactions as if the fight is happening in that moment. That chase scene, uh, not only is he vocally providing the uh, the beats of it as he's going, the foley is with him. Yep. It's, it was really nice. Yeah, it was fantastic. I love that style of... Uh, narration and the narrator narrating what's happening to them in the moment yet being outside of the moment at the same time it's just a beautiful way and really if you if you go back and listen to it it's not as complex as your brain makes it out it is him describing it and a lot of huh, uh, uh. <laughs> that's pretty much it uh, yeah but, but it brings it alive yeah, and totally. it also keeps it really clear It's the best of both worlds. So you have scene and summary working simultaneously. Yeah, it's an optical illusion because of the narration. You think you're hearing more than you actually are. Ryan, you said you chose this out of a lot of other episodes. And is there something in particular that made this? I mean, we just carried on about the stuff we liked. But is there something else we haven't covered that makes it stand out to someone who's heard a lot more of Rocky Jordan than we have? The way they describe the tambourine, his cafe, um, at different times, you almost feel like uh, Indiana Jones is going to walk through the door, get a drink, and then disappear back into the street. Sometimes you hear beggars shouting outside in the distance. You can almost taste the dust of this place. But there are other characters that reappear throughout this series. There's a Sergeant Greco, who is the power-grabbing person who really hates Jordan. It's like he is racist against Rocky for being an outsider in Egypt. And and so he's constantly trying to pin things on Jordan. And Captain Sabaya is having to rein Greco in a lot. So it's uh, Greco can be comedy relief, but he can also just be really irritating. And you can't wait for him to get his comeuppance. There's a lot of femme fatales running through here, which I know Eric's ears just pricked up of just some woman dropping in, and then they're off on another adventure out into the desert on, in a Jeep. Uh, <laughs> the later ones with George Raft, I personally don't like, and I got nervous because this particular episode was the audition for George Raft later on. And so you can hear the differences in the two actors, and Raft just kind of sounds like, yeah, I'm here to get a check where Moyles is more like, I'm Rocky Fortune. Or, damn, Eric, I'm Rocky Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, I mean, the character, not to the detriment of the story, but the character Rocky, like, the guy is a jerk. I mean, he's got, I know he's got a moral code under there, but just willfully resisting every little thing for no apparent, well, no, there's reasons, but 
like the initial envelope check, like, no, no, if you want to get my service, you got to come get me, of just pulling teeth to get a simple task out of him. This is the fourth from the end of the series. And throughout the series, this poor cafe owner has just been dragged through the desert on so many different things. Anybody comes in and he gets dragged into it. Uh, and so I would be pretty jaded myself by the end of this. So <laughs> I'm ready to pack up and go back home. Is it- and that's an interesting idea is that he is not a person for hire. He's a guy who runs a restaurant. He's a business owner. And it's just that he lives in such an exciting city <laughs> that he gets <laughs> dragged into escapades each and every week. Does that uh, format ever feel strained to you at all? Or is it you just roll with it because it's so well done? Uh, there's a lot of different characters that come in that are, are recurring. So you don't know from week to week if Greco is going to be on there or if it's going to be a personal matter with Sam Sabaya. Over the course of the episodes, you realize just what kind of a friendship they have. Um, they have each other's backs, even though uh, Sabaya is, you need to open up to me because I'm the law and you need to respect me. And Jordan's like, I'm going to do it alone. Um, but yeah, a lot of things happen to Jordan and it's just made him jaded. But it doesn't have the the really terrible lines that, uh, who is that guy that rented the boats? We did an episode with him. Oh, you're um, talking about Pat Novak for Pat hire, Novak, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Pat <laughs> Novak just stuck his neck out and got into everything, where Rocky Jordan is just trying to stay away from everything and run a bar, <laughs> and everything keeps happening to him. Uh, you saw a little of their, uh, the depth of their friendship at the end of this episode, where Rocky persuades him to let the man with the uh, disfigured face keep the money for plastic surgery. That's why I chose this episode, because it had that little tease at the end of it that is throughout the entire series. You don't have it in every episode, Mm. but it's it's there underneath. I know you mentioned Femme Fatales, but one thing I liked about this particular episode is that it lacked one. The tone throughout suggested there would be one, and I really liked that the female who was introduced is actually just a loving wife who is legitimately concerned about her husband. And there's no twist. There's no subterfuge there. I think they play the expectation that there might be quite well. So you have your suspicions. But uh, as a listener, I was satisfied when it turned out she is what she appears to be. The lack of twist in this type of story is a twist. (laughs) Um, Question for everybody. Am I the only one that sees the obvious connections to Casablanca and Rick owning a bar and going through adventure things in his town of uh, Casablanca? Does it not seem <laughs> no? I'm laughing at Rick's adventure things as like a name for a radio <laughs> spinoff. Right. It's just a guy, an American, owning a bar in the Middle East. Yeah. And it's very similar, you know, and... Uh, bad things are happening and there's a local gendarme that he befriends and it just seems very similar to me and seems like this could possibly then be trying to capitalize on the success of that i think there are definite parallels yeah i've only seen casablanca once what it t- took me a long time to see it and i oh that's casablanca it's really good and then i haven't seen it again since so i don't have the the deep deep knowledge of casablanca hmm Am I kicked off the podcast? <laughs> you guys remember when Tim and I were friends? <laughs> <laughs> My personal conspiracy theory is that they did Casablanca. It went off well. They decided to make this series. They couldn't afford Bogart, and so they did this. And then Bogart was pissed, and so they allowed him to do the bold venture with, with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Consolation prize. Because bold venture isn't, to me, as good as, as Rocky. I don't think that's a reach at all. Let's call it fact. <laughs> hey, do you guys remember when Tim told us he's only watched Casablanca once? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said it was good. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid his verdict was going to be like, meh. <laughs> I mean, I was afraid that watching it, like, oh, boy, I hope I like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be in so much trouble if I don't like this. Oh, I have plenty of movies that I'm supposed to love, and I watch them and I go, oh, no. I may never speak of this publicly. Any other thoughts, gentlemen? 
that you want to get out about this episode? I did not know what Rocky Jordan was before hearing this and uh, listening to it. I love the characters. I love the plot. It is so amazingly well produced. Uh, I will, will take your word for it. This is one of the best examples of the series, but the rest of the series could be close to this. It would still be an amazing series. Uh, that's my, my little pre-vote summation of why this is good. It's pretty much a vote. <laughs> you don't know what I'm going to vote. <laughs> I've got to throw out some trivia that I know doesn't need to make it to the podcast, but I thought this was funny. Uh, I, I went down the rabbit hole of the writers to see if they wrote anything else that I might have enjoyed in a different series, and I couldn't find much, but I did find that one of the writers' name was Gomer Cool. And his name <laughs> was the inspiration for Gomer Pyle from the Andy Griffith show. And I thought, wow, this is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is my legacy. <laughs> no, that's that's staying in. <laughs> yeah. That's a fantastic piece of trivia. Before we vote, uh, in all fairness, because we have loved this up and down, I will give you my my one disappointment with this script. And it's one of those weird double-edged sword things where it is both its strength and a little tiny weakness to me is because it managed to balance so many different characters and so many different potential motives that I had a little let down, um, particularly in the realization, although it makes narrative sense, that there was never any backstory between Rocky and the man from Damascus. For some reason, I found that particularly intriguing that he may have done this guy some sort of wrong in a small enough way that he couldn't even remember it. And so I became strangely invested in that subplot, which may just be me, <laughs> not really a critique of the script. But so when it just became something that was just, oh, he he never knew Rocky. I was like, oh, I, I felt like there was a really interesting character thing to be discovered in there. That was the whole I thought was, why did they choose Rocky? If Rocky didn't do anything to this guy, and this guy didn't know Rocky, why did they pick this guy out of all the Egyptians to mess with to get their little plot going in order to escape from the town? They could have done it with anybody else and still created a, a fuss and uh, the gunshots and whatever and get run out of town. They picked Rocky, and they picked the wrong one. <laughs> Up until right now, I'd forgotten about that plot line. And give you an idea of how invested I was in not thinking about that and how much uh, enjoyment I was having. And now that you bring that up, Josh, I'm like, yeah, hey, what was all that about? And then what Ryan just said made me go, yeah. So thanks, guys, for bringing up the <laughs> plot holes that I had not noticed. I'll tell you, I liked it. Um, <laughs> the That part of, of Rocky's character of like, did I wrong this guy? I don't remember doing it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. True, you're right. It it did provide um, character insight in the end. I can see getting caught up in that, like, oh, this will be interesting. But I was just so... This whole show, for me, is like a laser beam on the floor, and I'm a cat. <laughs> Whatever's going on in front of me, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool, too. Moving on, moving on. Now it's over here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I don't think it's going to be a big surprise, but we should vote. I can't thank you enough. I'm voting first. Ryan, thank you. I've got something else to listen to that I had wrong. I thought it was something completely different. This is just so fantastic. It's everything that I love. This is a classic. This is the best radio show ever done ever <laughs> in the history of ever. And this particular episode is awesome. Now, I think it does stand the test of time, though, as far as the genre. It's just really well done and just quite a gift that you've given me. Thank you. I think it sometimes gets a little hard of I, my instinct is to call this a classic because it, it is an artistic achievement that is amazing. It's a technical achievement that's amazing. And I think in terms of like, and a classic is a thing that you can give to any modern listener and they would turn them on to, to uh, old radio. And this does have the one small thing of white actors doing dialects. Sure which to some modern listeners might detract from the enjoyment. As we said, though, yeah, I think it's a very sophisticated portrayal of Cairo. I think it does not impair my enjoyment at all. Um, so classic with that asterisk of if this is something that bothers you, you it, it might bother you. Yep. 
I think any modern listener who listens to this and has the expectation that it would be performed in the way we expect things to be performed today would never listen to old time radio ever, period, end of story, uh, because that kind of presentism will not allow you to to do that. But I think for sure, as a piece of entertainment, it stands the test of time. I would have to listen to more Rocky Jordans to really determine whether I consider this a classic. But what it passes this really important test for me, and that is that it makes me want to listen to more. And if the first time you hear a series makes you like want to immediately play the next one, that's a really big accomplishment. I mean, the caveat being I have heard Rocky Jordan before, like 25 years ago, I think one or two of them, because it was very popular on um, when radio was. I remember hearing it with, uh, who did that? Uh, Stan, Stan Freeberg. Freeberg. I'm Stan Freeberg. <laughs> when radio was. <laughs> I have no recollection of it, and uh, this just was a delight from top to bottom for me. Ryan? I, I just feel at least somewhat vindicated because the uh, way back when you first started, um, I sent an email into the show, hey, would you do something with Robert A. Arthur? He wrote a lot of uh, three investigator books that I loved as a kid, and he wrote a lot of Mysterious Traveler. And y'all picked the worst episode. And roasted me so hard. <laughs> These two did. I will still argue with you, Ryan. I didn't know that was you. I still think that's the <laughs> best episode of Sealed Book. Wait, what episode was that? It was uh, Broadway Here I Come. It was something to do with uh, a guy escaping from a, a prison. A on trunk? A bus. And, and, and you're right. It was terrible. Oh. Oh, uh, like, no, guy. no, no. That That's Murder by Experts, the guy in the bus. This is old guys try to remember old time radio, which is always uh, thrilling. But <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember getting that email from you. And I'm glad that you stayed a listener because I remember you being like, I'm really disappointed. I'm like, wow, I lost my first <laughs> listener and I barely started podcasting. <laughs> Rage quit, yeah. <laughs> I will have you know that I listen to every single episode of Sealed Book to choose that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Did y'all listen to the intro to this show as he's talking about Cairo and just know that he's thinking Broadway is my beat in New York while he's reading this because it's the exact same oh. <laughs> deadpan description because it's larry thor if we didn't mention who does the uh, opening announcements for the show i'm sorry we sidetracked you totally ryan for your vote oh i'm two thumbs up always <laughs> it's a, to me <laughs> to me it's a classic of just the genre of this kind of program but also i think it stands the test of time because the foley is so good and it matches yeah. and the music works and I, i'm probably jaded because i listened to so many other episodes but you can hear in other episodes, just background going on that you wouldn't expect unless you're listening for it like I was. Like, you you guys got me into Gunsmoke listening to stuff that's there but not there, and that was in this episode. Yeah, Tim only saw Casablanca once. <laughs> hey, Tim, tell him other stuff. <laughs> Less embarrassing <Please>. stuff. Uh. <laughs> Please go visit my website, <laughs> ghoulishdelights.com, home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes there. You can find out what we actually said about the sealed book. I was just looking, and apparently that is not the first uh, example of that writer we did. We also did uh, The Good Die Young. Yeah, pretty good stuff. Anyways, I'm <laughs> off track here. Um, you can leave comments. You can vote in polls. Let us know what you think of these episodes. Um, do you love this as much as we do? You certainly must. Why wouldn't you? Um, you can click uh, and uh, get on our social media pages. You can check out our Instagram, our Facebook, our whatnot. There's not a social media app called Whatnot that I know of. Uh, <laughs> not yet. You can get on our Threadless store, buy some swag, or you can join us on our Patreon page. Like Yes. Ryan. Go to patreon.com slash the morals and become a Ryan. 
<laughs> no, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, we have all sorts of great stuff there. We have bonus episodes. Uh, we have happy hours, which uh, we have had many a fine happy hour with Ryan. Ryan, uh, I assume since you're here, you enjoy being a patron. Yes. Oh. That is the best <laughs> endorsement we can get is yes, I am factually a patron. I was a patron from from way back of a little amount, like $5 a month or something. But I quit smoking several months ago and realized just how much money I was setting on fire. And I was like, <laughs> hey, I know some guys that I could do this. And, and I've, I've got other charities and stuff that I do. And I was like, well, what the hell? I can increase my Patreon and enjoy it uh, without having to smoke. So it's, for me, as a winner. Thanks for taking care of yourself. <laughs> we saved your life. <laughs> You didn't happen to be smoking about two to three thousand dollars a month <laughs> by chance in cigarettes, because well, but when you think about it, and you think of the time that I spent doing that, and I was just like, "Damn, son, you could have been doing something else a long time ago." <laughs> uh, that my friend always says, "Education costs," <laughs> and it's it's education. As Sammy Davis Jr. said to Frank Sinatra on his deathbed. Frank said, I'm so sorry, Sammy. I got you in all this smoking and drinking in this lifestyle. And Sammy said, Frank, I enjoyed every goddamn cigarette I smoked. <laughs> <laughs> and then he fell over dead. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, if you'd like to see us performing live, <laughs> we do live audio drama on stage. We do classic recreations of old time classic radio shows, and we do a lot of our own original work. We perform monthly and have been for a very long time. You can come see where we're performing every month by just going to ghoulishdelights.com. There you'll see where we're performing and what shows we're performing this month. And if you can't make it, physically there become a patron like uh, ryan and with that patron uh subscription you get a uh video of our live shows where we do these performances and that's part of being a patron so you can see them that way as well ghoulishdelights.com that's where that is hey what's coming up next uh, next, we will have another patron with us. Greg will be here with an episode from another series that we have never featured on the podcast before. The Man in 206 from Dark Venture. Until then... And also, the guy named Gomer had a uh, secretary named Lincoln. And then his secretary had a secretary named Kennedy. You guys have... You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain that joke later. So, Ryan, there's an example of what's not going to make it into the podcast. <laughs>